and we wanted to take uh, 30 seconds to start this wonderful um, opportunity for open water coaches. I wanna say a huge thank you to the chair of the open water committee, Mr. Rick Walker, and the general secretary of the committee, Mr. Bert Schroeders, for organizing this for all of us. And I am convinced that it will be an incredible learning opportunity Please share this with everybody in your open water community. Um, let's spread the word. The videos will be posted on the website and let's make open water in the Americas one of our strongest disciplines. So enjoy, learn a lot and Rick and Bert, thank you very much. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, all your efforts and uh, certainly um, all of your support and uh, hope you have uh, a, a tremendous day and because I, I know you're busy. So good morning, everybody. Um, and we want to uh, welcome you uh, to the first ever uh, open water clinic and uh, hope that you will pick something up. I, I will start from the very beginning and, and say that uh, we're probably going to cover many things that you have um, or currently are already doing, and uh, uh, which is great, uh, but it's always good to uh, get some feedback or um, some uh, uh, assimilation that uh, what you're doing is, is what others are doing and it's working. So uh, we greatly uh, want to uh, share that with you. Some of the things you may not have thought about or have thought about and thought it might be stupid um, in open water. Uh, I have found that uh, there's very few things that are that are uh, actually stupid. Uh, they might not be the smartest things to do, but um, certainly um, it is uh, something to consider. Right from the from the get go, uh, please feel free to use the Q and A. Uh, in the chat, and uh, if you're Spanish speaking, um, plan español, por favor siéntanse la libertad de mandar su pregunta en español. Um, and at different sections of the clinic, um, we will uh, try to address some of those questions. All right, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. If I can find it. Of course I can. I apologize. I'm trying to. Here we go. All right, so the uh, Pan Am Aquatics Open Water Clinic, uh, this is the first ever and hopefully many more. We will be doing a uh, clinic for athletes and we will also be doing a clinic for officials. Pan Am Aquatics um, really has become a great resource uh, if you go to their website and then specifically to open water, there are some resources there. Uh, there's some videos um, that you can pick up information and gain access to support. I am always available through Pan Am Aquatics. Bert is available through Pan Am Aquatics. Uh, if there's questions or uh, needs that you have, if it's something that we can help you with, uh, that's a great place to go is Pan Am Aquatics. All right, we want to start off with uh, first, how do you develop uh, your open water plan? Um, first off, you want to generate programs that will be exciting uh, to both athlete and coaches. Now, many times the athletes are the ones that will come to you and say, hey, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this but it doesn't fit within your plan. 
However, if you've got all of your athletes or many of your athletes coming to you with the same type of a, a request, all of a sudden it becomes a little bit more important. Um, so just be on your toes with that. Um, if it's something that you would like to get your athletes to do, then you're going to have to kind of tap into what interests them. Uh, what's something that really kind of gets them excited? Make a game. All of our swimmers um, love games during practice. And uh, if you include as part of that game something that would be open water related, they're going to learn to have fun in the pool during a practice. Uh, doing something that's open water. And if they find out that that's actually something that you get all the time in open water, all of a sudden they take on an, a, a new perspective of um, you know what open water is. There's a stigma about open water. Um, you know, it, it, it's too long, it's too hard, you get beat up. Uh, and in reality, uh, that that in most cases is... <laughs> is not close to the truth. Um, it, it's certainly not too long. Uh, when open water first started out, it was 25 kilometers. Um, in, in many cases, a lot of people would say that was too long, uh, but a lot of people did it. So generate type, uh, type of programs that will create some excitement. Uh, for example, uh, when we first started in the U.S. Uh, with our open water program, um, the coaches took on the, you know, had the mentality that open water and pool didn't go together. And um, we wanted to be able to show them that it actually does. The distance training that you would do for open water is the same with a, a couple of exceptions as the distance swimming you would do for the pool. Many of our open our finest open water swimmers are the finest pool distance swimmers. So there it, it interchanges. Um, so what we did was uh, we couldn't get the coaches to bring their athletes to a open water national championship or event that was separate. So we brought the open water event to the coaches. And during junior nationals or senior national championships, we would include an open water swim that would happen after the swim or after the competition. Coaches were already there, athletes were already there. Hey, why not? Let's have some fun. Um, so they started to do it. And slowly but surely it started to grow. You want to uh, set goals of when they should be up and running. So for example, um, if you want to have within your own club uh, or within your federation, um, you know, programs that are up and running, set a goal of when you want it to, to be up and running. I would not set goals of tomorrow, uh, you know, unless it's, it's very obvious, hey, we could start doing that right now. Uh, you get, you're gonna have to spend a little bit of time convincing people um, you're also going to have to spend some time putting it together uh, because you don't want to throw something together, have it fail, and then then it's going to be a, a huge hurdle to overcome that in the future. Who is going to be responsible for seeing that it gets done? Within your club, typically that's going to be you, the coach. Within your federation, typically that's going to be who is in charge of open water and opening uh, overseeing uh, what is in open water uh, within the Federation. So these are ideas that can be implemented. Um, I believe, uh, you know, long time ago when we first started uh, our open water in the US, uh, I, we came up with a 10 year plan. And I believe that we have uh, that available on uh, the Pan Am Aquatics website. And that would be something that would incorporate a lot of pool swimming. Um, you know, we had our first uh, within Pan Am Aquatics, we had our first uh, virtual meet that could be done in the pool. Uh, and we recognized the, the winners. Um, that was well attended. Uh, we had a, you know, a lot of athletes, hundreds of athletes uh, send in uh, their results. 
from clubs and coaches and federations. So that that was a good start from for us as Pan Am Aquatics. You want to do quarterly checks to make sure that um, what uh, what you have or what you want to be implementing is is being done. Um, so you can't come up with this idea and then all of a sudden, you know, just drop the ball and let it go. Come back at the end of the year and say, why didn't it get done? Quarterly checks need to be done just to see that progress is being done and the people that are in charge of that are, are getting things done, uh, are getting the help and the support that they need uh, in developing. Then you want to implement the plan and stick to it. Unlike uh, many things where you know we're we're accustomed to changing on the dime um, and, and having to react, there you know I, I can tell you from experience, um, I as a coach, I as an administrator, um, got beat up a lot um, in trying to put some of these programs together. It was very difficult changing the mentality of other coaches who simply didn't believe that open water should be any part of swimming, uh, much less pool swimming or anything involved uh, together. So if, if I had changed or if we had changed on a dime, uh, we would constantly be changing and nothing would stick. So, you know, think it through. If you're putting the plan together, stick to it. It's going to take some time and you're going to go through some growing pains. So uh, just be prepared for that. And, you know, understand that uh, the harder people are fighting, sometimes that means you're making the best progress because now you've got their attention. Eventually that starts to wear down and answers get, you know, get addressed or questions get addressed with answers and uh, you can move on and forward. At least they're not gonna be standing in your way. All right, um, Chris, do we have any questions that we need to address right now? Nope, all good. Okay. All right, designing a swimming pool workout for open water swimmers. There are a lot of things that, uh, that you can do uh, if you're already experienced in open water, um, you, you certainly can take the similarities of what is happening in the pool and what will happen in the open water and, you know, make that also part of your pool workout. All right. So first thing that you need to do is figure out what is the distance you are training for. Is it a 3K? Is it a 2.5K? Is it a 5K or a 10K? Uh, or in some cases, you know, is it farther? So determine what that is. Secondly, where are your athletes' ability now? All right, so um, I, I have had many of athletes who have said, hey, I want to do a 5K, but they can't finish a 2,000-meter uh, workout. So obviously here, here is my challenge. I've got to get them not only to be able to do that 2000, but I got to get them to do over twice that, you know, two, uh, two and a half times that. So um, you need to know what their abilities are. Three, what kind of commitment are your athletes willing to give? Uh, and I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I had uh, a young man uh, who wanted to uh, make his Olympic team uh, in 2012, um, and his practice habits did not reflect what an Olympic athlete is, um, but I felt like he had potential. So I sat him down. And we went over what the commitment level would be. And I let him know the minute that he can't, he fell short of that commitment because I was going to be committed. As a coach, I, I was going to be committed. I'd stay late. 
Um, I do extra workouts. I do whatever it took to help him get there. And, uh, but I needed his commitment. So once we had agreed to that, um, we started working on the tasks and the commitment level that he needed to put in because at the Olympic level, there isn't any room for non-committed athletes. They just don't, they aren't there. So um, in the, through the long haul, I had to keep reminding him, hey, you're the one that wanted this. You came to me and, and you wanted this. Um, where is your commitment? I'm here. You missed workout. That's not going to happen again. Um, so eventually we got it to the point where he became more determined than he ever had been. Um, and a gentleman that has a heart of gold and, and desperately wanted to represent his country at the Olympic Games, he ultimately ended up doing that. Um, so uh, very proud of him. But it is something that that's going to require some commitment. And if, if you take an athlete, number one, it's great that they want to be able to do that. But if they don't have the commitment, that's where you got to start. So understand it's not just the swimming ability. All right. How much time do you have to train? Some of you have very little pool time. Then we got we to gotta figure out a way. Uh, to either get them more to pool time, strike up a relationship, mend some relationships so that you can get what you need. Um, sometimes that means that you're going to have to do extra things on the outside that don't pertain to what you're trying to do with your athletes. Um, that's going to be commitment on your part. So you have to figure out how much time do you have to train and how how best to get that that workout in. Um, lastly, how much pool time do you have once a day, twice a day, three times a day? Um, so sometimes uh, you might not be able to get, uh, you know, more than an hour, hour and a half. It's very difficult to, to put in the kind of training that you're going to need for a 10K and be very good. Um, so can you take that pool time maximize that and then find a lake or a river or an ocean and uh, pick up another workout somewhere there. Can you set up a course out in the ocean that the athletes can be uh, get used to? And every day that you show up there, it's going to be the same thing, just like, you know, you would find in the pool. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth out in the open water in a lake or a river or, or the ocean. It's going to be the, the same thing. You're going from this point to this point. You're this close to shore. Uh, we're going to have this type of safety uh, measures set up uh, so that um, you can accommodate more pool times. All right, moving on. These are some of the things that you need to ask yourself um, as you start to develop. Uh, your open water plan. How much pool space will you have uh, to work out with? All right, so have, and do you have the entire pool? Uh, you can do an open water uh, workout in the pool by setting up buoys, take out all the lane ropes, set up buoys, and place them in the corners of the pool. Uh, 50 meter pools obviously would be great. Uh, we have done that all the time and uh, simply have the swimmers going around and around and around uh, within the pool. Uh, also getting a chance to work on buoy work. And uh, from the side of the pool, they can learn how to do feed, uh, feeding from a feed stick. What kind of support will you have uh, from your club, parents, and federation? Got to work from the top down, all right? So if this is something that you as a club or you as a coach really want to push, it doesn't make any sense that your athletes are preparing for something that your federation doesn't support. So the federation has to be convinced that this is a, um, a something that has overwhelming support interest 
because they're they're going to be uh, accommodating those things that their constituents want. If a lot of people want open water, that's when they'll start putting more effort and more support into it. Your parents, your parents are, um, you know, I, I, I know many times um, I have heard over my coaching career, uh, you know, the, the best uh, club to coach for, uh, for a coach uh, is an orphanage. Um, you know, <laughs> because they don't have parents to deal with. Um, so your parents can be your enemy or they can be your best friend. If the parents are convinced that this is the best thing for their swimmer, they will be your biggest uh, cheerleaders. They will go and talk and argue and fight for uh, all of the things that you want to the people that you don't want to be fighting with. They'll do all that work for you. So get the parents um, on your team and, and support you and then set them free to go out and fight for you. Um, your club, starting with your board. If you've got a parent's uh, board um, or if you've got uh, you know, uh, uh, parents that are uh, involved in fundraising, um, many of the parents are influential and know political people, know people in power. Uh, you might have a pool person that says, hey, we don't want to give you that pool time, but your parents know who their boss is and who their boss is. And next thing you know, you've got some pool time. So work your way up and work to the, to the uh, places that you're going to need that support, starting with the Federation. That's where the selections are going to be. That's where the financial support uh, can be. Uh, and internationally, it's all going through the Federation anyway. Next thing you have to ask yourself is how committed are you as a coach putting in more time and changing the way you think about training? All right. If you're new here and you're trying to figure out, um, you know, how, how can I incorporate open water in your swimming? Uh, in your pool training, that's a great first start. You're already in a position where you're open to the idea. The coaches that are struggle, uh, that will struggle, will be the ones that simply start out by saying you can't. In open water, you can't doesn't exist. If you're in open water swimming, anything is possible. The most mediocre athlete can be a champion on any given day, under any given you know, condition. That's the beauty of open water. Many times the fastest swimmer in the pool isn't always the best open water swimmer. The open water swimmer that can adapt and has the mentality uh, to be able to say, yes, I can, quite often will find themselves improving and in a, a much higher level, uh, simply through their mentality. So you as a coach, you know, need to, need to start asking, you know, how committed are you? Are you willing to put in the extra time? And if you are, then go out there and make those changes. What access do you have to open water practices? And so we already discussed that you can do this uh, within the pool. And, and and that's that's great, um, but can you, do you have access to a river? Do you have access to an open body of water like a lake? Uh, it doesn't have to be very big. Uh, anything that would give you you know eight hundred to fifteen hundred uh, circular loop uh, is a great open water venue. Do you have access to an ocean? Those uh, so those are things that you need to consider as part of your plan. Do you have an escort craft available for use? All right, this is uh, probably the one of the most, if not the most important thing that I, I would like you to take away from this. Do not think that you're gonna take your entire team out for an open water swim on a lake in the ocean or in, uh, on a river 
uh, let's say you've got 15 or 20 in your group and you've got a kayak or you've got a motorized boat, don't think that you're going to be out there uh, and providing some kind of safety for them. Please understand that if you are in an ocean or in a lake and you're swimming away from shore, however far you got to swim out, that's also how far you got to swim back. So if you're going to be challenging your athletes and everybody's good, 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 and you get out there to where you're going to start to turn around, now your athletes are fatigued. They've gone about as far as they actually could go, and now they've got to come all the way back. You're in one boat, you've got one set of eyes, and you've got to be doing head counts. If one swimmer goes down, you're going to have to get them in that boat or on top of your kayak, and then you've got to get them to shore, which means what? You just now left all of your swimmers out there with nobody watching them. This is going to be very complicated. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a very dangerous situation. The other thing you need to understand is that if you're not a very good kayaker or paddleboard uh, person, and you've got a, a, a swimmer strapped across, might be conscious or unconscious, strapped across the front of your board, you're going to be struggling getting back to shore. So it's going to take longer to get back to shore and then it'll be difficult getting back to the group. Either way, you've got a group now that's not being uh, watched or supported. And if another person goes down, you might be lucky enough to be able to get them on board, but now it's that much more difficult. So it just escalates. Understand, as far as you go out, they gotta come back. So keep that in mind for their, their capability. Also keep in mind for their safety. If you've got 15 to 20 people, you need to have multiple crafts out there looking out after them. If you look at a competition, how many safety craft are out there for the number of athletes? That's exactly what you have to emulate in your workouts. If it's close to shore, that might be a little bit different. But understand, that uh, and, and I have experienced this myself, and, and I would I <laughs> I would tell you that I am expressing this through my own mistakes. I had my college team out there, and I thought, hey, I've got a motorized craft, uh, and I'm going to be good to go. They're they're going to stay together, and, and I'll be able to watch everybody. And next thing I know, the faster swimmers start taking off and the slower swimmers start to slow down. Now I've got this massive distance between the two. I couldn't possibly, I could not possibly watch after all of them. And here I am. I've got a lot of experience. I've got a lot of knowledge. And I did the one stupid thing that, um, you know, you should never do. I did it, and, and I kicked myself, you know, a hundred times over. Um, it scared me to death. Never did it again. We would never go for an open water swim unless I had enough people out there that could accommodate uh, a rescue, and then not leave, you know, my group uh, left there unattended. <clears throat> excuse me, unattended. All right. The next thing you need to understand is. Where are your hospitals and uh, the rescue vehicles, where are they going to go? And are they aware of where they're going to need to go? So what I did was every workout, I would tell <clears throat> the hospital who would alert ambulances that if anything happens and you get a call about this, about open water swimming, here is the, the location that the ambulance would need to go. And here is the potential risk or potential condi conditions that you will be working with. Drowning, uh, hyperthermia, fatigue, dehydration, you know, all the things that you might find in an open water swim. They were alerted that that's what they would 
be dealing with. And if they had to come out, they made sure that they had the equipment or whatever would uh, would be needed to support that kind of uh, emergency. So you need to make sure you know you are alerting. One of the things that uh, you know I did when I selected where I wanted to do my training was how far was it? If the hospital was five miles away at, at this lake, and I had another lake that had a hospital or an emergency unit, uh, you know, a mile or two away, I always chose the one that was closest to an emergency facility. So just try and keep that in mind. All right, Chris, are, do we have any questions? We do. Um, from Nadine, we have a question about those in landlocked areas. So do you have any recommendations for those don't, that don't have good access to any open water and only have access to, for example, a 25 meter pool, like a standard four or six lanes? Is it right. better to work on distance, straight line swimming or doing broken? That's great. And Nadine, welcome to the, uh, to the clinic. Nadine is uh, uh, well known in the open water uh, community. Um, brilliant woman. And thank you for the question. Um, so Nadine, uh, and, and you know this uh, just as well as I do. In the US, uh, when we first started out, and I don't think that that has changed uh, too dramatically, um, most of our, at least 90% of our national team swimmers um, came from areas that did not have an ocean. Uh, many of them came from areas that did not have a lake that they had access to uh, or came from the northern part of the country that uh, uh, only allowed for uh, a, a brief period where the water was warm enough to swim in it. Um, so great question on landlocked. Uh, and, and what I would do is, you know, I, I would take the lane lines out if you really... Uh, I'm trying to answer this so you understand. Um, if you have swimmers that go from 25 meters or 25 yards to 50 meters, they'll, and if you were a swimmer yourself, I always remember the difference was like, oh my God, 50 meters goes forever, especially when you're coming out of short course uh, season. There's an adaptation that you need to make. And once you make that, it's pretty quick. Uh, but once you make that, then it's not, you know, everything's pretty good. Open water is the same thing. In the pool, you always have your walls. And at the walls, even though it's a brief moment, the body does get rest. In open water, it never gets rest. So you need to um, prepare mentally and physically for your body to understand what that feels like. And whether it's a 25 yard, 25 meter, 50 meter, uh, if you take the lane ropes out, and even though you get dizzy in a 25 meter or a 25 yard, it's very short, you're still teaching the body that it's not going to be stopping and, and preparing it that way. Uh, is it ideal? I don't know. We, we've had um, plenty of swimmers that didn't have access to a 50 meter pool who made the national team and they didn't have access to open water. Uh, they just pounded out some really good workouts. So you can accommodate that through the workouts, but you can also do that mentally and physically uh, by taking out the lane ropes and going, you know, big circles around the pool uh, and then shift it. Uh, you can do zigzags, um, but preparing the body not to stop. I, I hope that answers and addresses your question, Nadine. Very good one. Um, so a couple others, and if you, yep. you're going to talk about it later on, feel free to just say so. Yep. Um, so not quite a question, but more of a comment. So if you have any thoughts to add on this, yep. um, the coach said, I have athletes in the pool who are good and also in open water, but have other coaches kind of disagree or feel differently because of potential overtraining. Do you have any thoughts? Comments. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm, I'm on the fence um, with with overtraining. 
Um, and, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, when, and, and it, it, I was an 80s swimmer, uh, 70s and 80s. And so we were 18, 20,000, you know, yards or meters a day. Uh, now, today, that would be overtraining. But we always managed. We came, you know, day after day after day after day after day. Uh, we, we came back. We didn't know any different. Uh, we're a little bit smarter now through time. Um, and there's a lot of benefits, actually, from some of that philosophy uh, that we've actually lost in our pool swimming. A lot of coaches would disagree with me, uh, and, and that's okay. Um, but for we, th times have changed also. We've also specialized more, whereas back in the 70s and 80s, maybe even into the 90s, um, you know, you were a overall swimmer. You swam all of the strokes. You swam all of the events. Um, now we're a little more specialized, so it makes sense to only train in those uh, energy systems, um, you know, more effectively. Um, so to answer your question, um, as a coach, you need to know your athlete. If your athlete begins to not be able to reap out or to recover, then you know you've hit, uh, you know, probably a peak level uh, of training for them. And you need to back it up and let them recover. Some athletes recover, um, you know, in 24 hours, some 72, some 48. Uh, but know your athlete. That's your job as a coach. And to me, that was one of the exciting things about my coaching because every day presented a new challenge. Um, and and I, th I think with open water swimmers, you want to try and, and keep pushing, you know, the, the boundary a little bit higher and a little bit higher, a little bit higher. So that, you know, if they're doing a 10 K Certainly, occasionally, they've got to be able to do at least a 12,000 or a 15,000 yard workout in a given day. All right. I strongly believe in training up to swim down. Now, that doesn't mean you have to get crazy and go 20,000 uh, to be able to do a 10K. But you've got to be able to get your athlete to, to be able to get to at least the level daily of the uh, distance that they're going to be swimming. That being said, uh, that's best for the mentality of your athlete. So we'll get into this a little bit uh, as, as we go. But, uh, you know, if, if your athlete can get to 8K and a 10K swim, mentally, they uh, surely I, I can do another 2K. I'm almost done. If they start that mentality at 2K, and they've got 8K left, and they're already wondering if I can make it, that's when you've got a problem. So that gets addressed during your workouts and, and giving them the confidence to be able to, uh, to finish. Hope I, uh, I covered that. Yes, yeah, I was, think that was good. Was there There's a lot one? more questions, but um, some of them are related to this. Some of them might be covered later on. So hope we'll okay. move on to the next stuff, right. and then uh, I'll keep them kind of in the queue. And we can see if we have time for them later. All right. All right. So developing a federation plan. These are some of the things that if you're not involved, um, uh, you know, working with your federation, your, your uh, coach, and, and you're trying to get your program going, it isn't even on your federation's radar. Um, you know, these are, this is what I want to address right now. Start with, um, or I'm sorry. Um, this one is going to be uh, designing your workouts. This was mistitled. Um, start with your uh, a long warm up. All right. In open water swims, uh, you know, the debate would be: Do they get in and warm up, uh, or or not? You know, prior to their long swim. Um, you know, I <laughs> they got a long swim to warm up anyway. All right, so it's really kind of a pref preference with your athlete. But in your workout, start with a long warm up and design your sets first by distance. All right, 
then by duration, then by time. So let me explain that a little bit. Long warm up. Design your sets by distance. So how far are they going to be swimming? Is it a three thousand meter swim uh, set? Is it a four thousand meter set? So I wanted to start longer for the set. All right, that means the body's working harder over a longer period of time. I wanted them to get adjusted to that. Then I wanted to work uh, by duration. All right, so how much time was that going to be taken up during the workout? Then I wanted to de uh, design it by time. So I started working on, we're going to be going this distance. It's going to take this long. And I want them to be putting in this kind of time per, per repeat. So if I wanted to do 10 400s, all right, first, that's my distance. Then eventually I started pour, putting more emph emphasis on this, you know, um, how long in between or on what. So if it's on five minutes, I wanted to work that down to 450, uh, or I'm sorry, 350 or uh, 330, and then work that duration down. Then I wanted to work on their time. So they, they start picking up their speed. The body has to be able to go, go the distance in order to be able to go the distance. That, I, that seems like a, 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 well, duh. You know, that's a no-brainer. But a lot of times we don't think about that. If they're going a 10K, you got to prepare their body to be able to do what? Go a 10K. So have that as part of your plan. It's simple, but we all the time, all the time we overlook that. So if they're doing a 5K, prepare them to go to a 5K. And they have to know that they're going to be able to do that. They have to be able to see that they're doing that in the water, in the pool, in order to be able to have the confidence to be able to do that well in an open water. Think of it this way. First, they have to be able to go the distance uh, they're going to swim in a workout, and then you will be leading them to be able to do the distance with less and less rest, and eventually no rest at all. Do you understand where we're going with that? So they had a lot of time over this duration of, time, uh, of a set, and then you're cutting out the time, which means the body is acclimating to going faster over a long period of time with little to no rest. That's very much like open water. And you're getting them closer and closer and closer to being able to do it, to adapt. Once you have achieved this level, you are going to add more distance to the total. So as they get acclimated to it, as they're able to swim faster with less rest, now give them a little bit more. And back to the question about overtraining, watch your athletes. It's, it's okay to give them some recovery. That's one of the mistakes that we made back, in, in, you know, in my day when we were doing 18 and 20,000. There was no recovery. It, it, it was just pound, 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 right? So give them some time to recover and uh, allow them to be able to come back and do it again. That's the, apt, uh, you know, adaptation, that stair step to being able to do more and more better and better. All right, starting with your long warmups, design your uh, sets by uh, your duration. Um, this is a duplicate, adding the distance. If they are going to go a 10K, they should be going around 14,000 daily, regularly, right? That's again, the mentality of training up to swim down, right? Um, we can all, you know, we, we went through a period of time where um, in the development of open wa water worldwide, um, open water swimmers can't do pool swimming. All right, think of it this way. 
if you've got a miler, uh, 1500 swimmer, who you think as a coach should be swimming it much faster, they've got the capability, they do it in workout all the time, but they're thinking I've got to pace it. And so they're spreading out their, uh, their pace throughout that, that 1500. And you know full well they could be doing that much faster and pace should be thrown out the window. They should just go for it. You put them in a 5K or a 10K and that 1500 is going to feel like a sprint. That also changes the mentality of the pool swimmer so that they start to train and, and approach their swims uh, completely different. All right. So the 14,000. If they do that on a regular basis, and that's not a problem, doing a 10K isn't going to be a problem. It's not going to be physically or mentally. If they are going farther uh, than, than that, then they need to be uh, doing a little bit further than the distance that they will be swimming. <clears throat> now, I will tell you uh, in the 25K, we never did that. Um, but if you follow the mentality, uh, every once in a while, you got to throw in a straight swim that will, you know, for example, if they're doing a 10K, every once in a while, throw in an 8K swim. Straight. Ready, go. I'll see you after 8,000. Boring, monotonous, uh, you name it, uh, brutal. Uh, they, you know, they want to go, they're going to, it's going to make their head blow up. Uh, that's okay. They need to be able to do that. And they need to learn how to have their brain work over that period of time. But if they can do an 8k, they certainly can do a 10k. You know it, they're going to know it. And they, they're the ones that need to learn that. All right. What is the race plan? All right. Uh, first off, Chris, is there anything we want to get into? Question wise. We do have questions and there's a lot of good ones. But right. uh, let, let's hit, let's hit some of those up. Do you want to do some of them now? Sure. Before we get into this race plan. I'm just trying to pick up a good one. Think, get, find a good one here. Um, can an athlete excel kind of in both like, pool swimming and open water? Kind of understanding there's differences involved. Can they? It, this coach has an athlete who enjoys both, but yeah. they're kind of wondering, you know, should they be steering them towards one, encouraging both? Yeah. Um, so uh, I believe it was 2012. Us Maluli um, won the 10K at the Olympic Games, turned around and won the 1500 uh, in the pool. Uh, Chad Hundeby, early on when open water first started. And, and again, I, I was telling you that uh, I got beat up uh, a lot by pool coaches. Some of them, you know, uh, regarded as the best pool coaches in the world. Um, you can't do open water and pool swimming at the same time with the same athletes and be successful. Chad Hundeby goes off and, and wins, uh, you know, world championships uh, and then comes back and wins uh, the 1500 a week later um, in uh, the, at the U.S. National Championships uh, against our best um, distance swimmers. Now, one of the things that, uh, um, that pool coaches had a problem with was um, in, in their mind, in the pool, you do sets, you do repeats, and, and you're working on pacing, all right? Uh, in open water, it's just one long pace. That actually isn't true. That pace changes. Uh, you, you need to be able to adapt. And aerobically, an open water swimmer typically is more aerobically prepared and has a better uh, or a larger aerobic capacity than a pool swimmer does. Uh, and, and we proved that out through some of the uh, testing that we did through the USOC. 
open water swimming and aerobic swimming, uh, pure aerobic, is a constant, is done constantly over time. In, in the pool, as I said, when you've got a turn, your body actually gets rest and that energy system goes down and then it has to come back up. We did the testing between uh, pool and open water uh, and the amount of time it took for the uh, pool swimmers to get back into the aerobic uh, was longer than it was for an open water swimmer. So we now learned training wise um, how to better prepare our open water swimmers if they've got a pool event in front of them uh, or uh, pool swimmers if they've got an open water event in front of them. So they can be done at the, at the same time. So coach, you've got an athlete that likes both, let them do both. Uh, if you've got questions, I'm available. Uh, there are plenty of resources and plenty of other coaches that will tell you uh, or help guide you on how to prepare uh, that athlete so that you learn um, how to better prepare your athlete. But I would never crush the interest, um, you know, uh, of an athlete that wants to be able to do both. All, all of our best open water swimmers in the world currently today, and I think throughout time, have actually been just below the very top in the pool. And now I would say uh, and suggest that most of our best uh, open water athletes now are some of the best pool uh, athletes uh, in the 1500. How about one more question and then we move on to the next topic. All right. Um, so this coach has a group that has you know, ample pool time, but how often should, for an athlete that's focusing on international 10 kilometer races, how often should they switch to lake or ocean swimming for a week or a month? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I, I think you can do it two ways. You can start out a, a, a bunch of workouts uh, and kind of narrow it down as you get closer to the event uh, because they've already built up the background. Uh, or you could start to build it up and, and gain more and more confidence. It just depends on how you want to approach it and how you want to prepare your athlete. But, you know, make a game out of it. And, and I would have even your sprinters. You know, uh, we did open water swims uh, with our college kids. Um, and, you know, we had our, our sprinters uh, also do those, those open water events. Um, you'd be surprised how good some of those sprinters are over a longer period of time. They just won't do it because they don't like it. Um, but those sprinters were the ones that were telling the stories all year long. You know, do you remember when we did this? And then, you know, they would come back and they would they would keep the story alive uh, because they were a part of that. Um, that being said, yeah, I, I wouldn't do it you know, all the time, you know, maybe once a week, um, maybe once every other week. Um, as you get closer, maybe uh, you would have your normal workout and then uh, keep the ones that are going to be swimming in the open water <clears throat> and, you know, take a, a quarter of the pool, finish up with the rest of your pool swimmers, open up, you know, the remainder of the pool, and then throw out some buoys or just have them going around and around and around, uh, but make a game out of it, make it interesting. Um, you know, whatever uh, will keep their interest into it and give them the confidence. But it doesn't have to be, you know, just because you have the space, just because you have the equipment, uh, doesn't mean you got to do that every day. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe uh, the best open water swimmers are doing this every day. I think they're spending most and a majority of their time training in the pool uh, because that's what we know best. And um, it's also a better way to get down to the specifics of the energy systems uh, and, and preparing them best uh, to be able to apply that over a longer period of time. So hope that answers that. 
All right, let's look at a race plan. <clears throat> All right, we know, and, and if you're inexperienced, have never seen an open water swim, um, or if you're experienced and, and an expert open water coach, um, the start will be very fast, hands down. Uh, everybody is trying to get on that line to the neck from the start to the first turn or that first buoy. It's going to be very, very fast. So how can we apply that to our workout? If, if we think about it, every once in a while, we need to um, put our athletes in, make sure they're good and stretched because they would be before an open water swim. We don't want to hurt them. But start off with a warm-up that's actually pretty fast uh that that requires them not to necessarily be prepared to go that fast like they normally would in a normal workout have them do something that's extremely fast early that will get them at least some experience or at least you know uh experience mentally of what that's going to feel like to go that fast you don't want the first time uh, throw them into an open water swim, have them come back and go, I had no idea it was going to be that fast. I burned out. I, I, you know, I burned out at the very beginning and I had the rest of the race to go. You can go fast and expend not as much energy if you simply know that it's coming. So prepare them in the, in the workout for that. All right. It'll settle into a pace. All right, it'll get back to a, a, a normal pace. Fast at first, and then slowing down a little bit. You, uh, I, I've yet to see an open water swim where um, the athletes maintain the same speed at the beginning uh, throughout that entire race. So it's gonna slow down and settle down a little bit. Um, so you have to work with your athlete well, I, I'll, I'll explain these and then we'll come back and, and uh, explain maybe a little bit of why I'm coming from where I'm coming from, All right? So you're going to settle down into a pace that's going to be fast at first and then slow down. Then there's going to be some speed play. So you're just going to be jockeying those uh, positions. It's not just one constant speed. If you want to move up, you're going to have to speed up faster than the pace of the swimmer in front of you. Right. If you want to slow down and let somebody else take over because you're tired of pulling them or your athlete is tired of pulling them. That pace is going to slow down. And then you're going to need to start to pick it back up. Right. Um, then you're going to be settling into a pace. There's going to be a long period of time where that pace is going to remain the same. Then it's going to start to build. Um, you know, that that can be 1,500 out, you know, 1.5 K, sometimes 2 K, but quite often about 1 K uh, to 1.5 K, that pace is going to start to pick up. That group or that athlete that's up in front is is mentally thinking, I want them out, out of the picture. I want to drop them. I want to get away. So they're also getting ready for the finish. That finish is going to be as fast, if not faster, uh, than what you had at the at the very beginning. All right, it's whatever you've got left. <laughs> I would hate to go a 10k and have an or uh, prepare an athlete to go a 10k, and and then have that athlete at the very end say, "Man, I had so much left." I'd be like, "Oh my gosh, what <laughs> 10k? You couldn't get it out, you know?" So. You definitely want that uh, that out there, all right? So let's look at what this means to your athlete and how you can prepare your athlete through your workout. We just discussed the start. Um, so maybe have some really, really fast warm-ups. Don't give them a warm-up. Throw them right into a set. That's an open water swim. You know, I mean, you're gonna they're going to be in there with little to no warm-up. And it's going to be showtime, ready, go, All right? So settling into a pace. It's going to be really, really fast at first. So here's, here's what I would do in a, in a pool workout with some of my swimmers. 
we would go a really fast warm up. <clears throat> then we would go some easy swimming. And then we come back and do some fast swimming every other one where they got to go fast, then they go in easy, then a fast, then an easy. And we would do that boom, 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 one right after another, because this is the way it hits you in an open water swim. If we want to train them and prepare them for that, then that is what we have to give them. And we have to simulate that, um, that exact condition in the pool as you will find it in the open water. So we get a little uh, speed play going. And uh, as, as I said down below, uh, speed play, trying to break the pack and fast slow. So you can, uh, you can compare athlete to athlete. If you've got some com competition going on in the pool, you can say, uh, you know, if swimmers are really, really close and they're three seconds apart on their, on their fast swims, and then the next one, they're five seconds apart, the one that's getting slower, that's the swimmer. You can say, hey, they're getting ahead of you. You know, they're breaking away. And, and so that swimmer can start to pick it up a little bit and it teaches them if the pack or a swimmer is getting away, it's still a long way to go. I can bring them, I can reel them back in. All right, uh, then settling into a pace. So then we'll go something that's gonna be a moderate pace uh, in the practice. Then we'll start to go um, some builds, 10, 20, 50s, build each one. And then the finish, uh, we might go at the end of the, uh, you know, 10 fifties uh, or 10 to 20 fifties where you're building each 50. Uh, maybe the last five are gonna be all out and, and try and get an average. And the next time that we do that workout, can I, can I make that average better? So all we're doing is teaching them um, how to prepare for that race and, and how to how to swim that better. What to look for in preparing for an open water swim. Do you have the ability to be on the water with the swimmers? All right. We discussed this a little bit. This will be, you know, just going over it again. Um, if not, you should not be doing a workout in the open water. It, it's it's plain and simple. If you can't provide safety, you shouldn't be out there. That you know they, that's why they say don't swim alone. Um, if you get into trouble, there's no one to help, and uh, you don't want to be that coach responsible. Do yourselves a favor. Hear what I'm telling you. If you cannot provide multiple uh, crafts uh, or a safe way to get your swimmers into shore, then do not be out there. And, and putting your athletes in danger. You will be liable uh, and it could very well, um, you know, ruin your career, uh, you know, much less having to live with that, you know, the rest of your life. That's why it scared me so, so bad. Um, you know, I, I thought about that. Uh, I had dreams uh, that were, were not good. Uh, and trust me, I've never done that again. All right. Is the water too cold or is it too warm? You know, we we have all gone through uh, many of you. If you're just getting started, um, we went through a period um, um, after one of our young men uh, uh, drowned in an open water swim. Um, you know, the water was extremely warm and, uh, you know, there was some question as to whether uh, the race should have even gone. Uh, there were other, you know, a lot of things that went into that, but we reviewed in the U.S. and I think many of the federations, you know, had an eye opener um, of what's too cold and what's too warm. If it's too warm, you can get into uh, dehydration uh, that's going to fatigue the athlete. And that's something that you're not going to know ahead of time. You don't have a way of knowing. Uh, so that's something that hey, we want to prepare for this, they're in a way to prepare for that. Other than if it's too warm, 
then don't have them out there. If it's too cold, you know, you're looking at hyperthermic, um, you know, uh, athletes where um, the blood starts to go to the core. Uh, and, and once that happens, you're in a very dangerous um, condition. And you don't want to be responsible for that without being able to, um, you know, uh, treat it uh, or uh, take care of it. So uh, if it's too hot, too warm, shouldn't be out there. Our emergency entity is aware of your activities. We went over this. Uh, if not, uh, you should not be out there, right? Hey, I forgot to call the ambulance or hey, I forgot to call the hospital. Okay, then don't go because they're not going to be prepared. And that most certainly will be the day that something happens. Are there motorboats running uh, where you're going to be swimming? This is a classic. Um, you know, if you've got boats running around, um, yeah, don't don't go out where the boats are. Um, can you keep your uh, swimmers safe? If not, you shouldn't be out there swimming. All right. Um, we you know we actually have open water competitions out where boats are running, but we have craft that are out there. Uh, be it the Coast Guard, um, you know, some kind of a port authority uh, with the lights flashing um, or boats with flags on it to warn the, the boats that, um, uh, you know, hey, this is a safe area. You need to be outside of this. So you need to work with your local governments uh, to make sure that you've got uh, things that are out there and safe. All right, breaking down an open water race. Um, so based on your knowledge, uh, this is what you're going to acquire. When you go to an open water swim, uh, the beauty of open water to me is that the coach plays a significant role in the success of their athlete, all right? You do in the pool, but you do it the same with everybody else, all right? And you don't get uh, a whole lot of uh, a credit sometimes for an athlete that, uh, you know, takes off, um, you know, because you're doing it for everybody. But breaking down, uh, you know, an open water coach uh, plays a significant role. Now, here's how you can help your athlete. I'm going to, uh, I'll use an example. We went to Japan. And uh, we were swimming partway around an island. And once we got to the other side, there was a buoy that we had to go around. And then you would swim back around the island, uh, back to the finish. So it was kind of like a, a, a sea. Started here, went around the island, turned the buoy, came back around the island and finished. There were a lot of things that were going on. You had tides, you had waves, you had currents. Uh, and, you know, those are all factors that will impact uh, an athlete. So what we did was we went out and talked to the local fishermen. And because the fishermen know when where the currents are. Uh, they know when the currents are, are strongest or at their weakest. Um, they know how long the shift will take. So go out there and, and acquire some of that information. The people that are uh, giving you the information, uh, for example, the organization or the organizers of the race don't always have the local knowledge, um, but the fishermen do. Uh, you know, surfers, uh, if, if you can if it's a place where, you know, large waves and you've got surfers out there, man, they know exactly what's going on because that's, that's what they do. They, they need to know how to ride the best wave, where the currents are, what time of day, when's best, what happens after it rains, what happens before it rains, uh, because these are all factors that you'll come into play with. Find out what the course looks like, all right? So once you've got the course, uh, then you can actually take that 
and say, we're going to be swimming here at this time. What can we expect? And if there are challenges, let's say current's coming in and the swimmers are going to be swimming against that current, is it better to be on the left side or the right side? Is it better to be centered? Is it better to go around wide or cut in? These are all factors that are going to be uh, helping your, your athlete uh, prepare for that swim and give them a race strategy. Where are the turns, right? Um, so how long are they, how far are they going to have to site? Are there going to be intermediate buoys to get them there? What is it that they can look at in order to get them straight to that next buoy? Give them that line sight um, that's going to get them there the quickest and the easiest. What is the competition? Who's going to be there? It, it, are, is it going to be other athletes that uh, aren't as experienced? Well, if you're an experienced athlete, that means they're probably going to be swimming alone. If they're really, really, really good athletes and your athlete is mediocre or beginning, that might mean they're going to be swimming alone. Or is it going to be very comparable and they're going to have to deal with a pack, which, which would be nice because uh, they can help. Where will the feeding stations be located? Right. This is going to determine at what cycle you're going to be feeding, if you're going to feed at all. What is the temperature of the day going to be? What is anticipated? If it's going to be a very hot day, the athletes are going to get dehydrated pretty quick and they'll need some of that hydration. So that means that you're going to want them to not skip, uh, you know, getting a feed off of the feeding pontoon. If it's going to be relatively cool, they may not need it, so work that out. What kind of a um, uh, condition are they going to be in so that you can tell them, hey, you need to come in for a feed or this is when you're going to feed? All right, what are the expected conditions? Is it going to be, is it going to be really wavy? Is it going to be slight chop? Is it going to be calm? All right. Um, how many co uh, competitors are there going to be? Is it going to be 20? Is it going to be 40? Is it going to be 100? Is it going to be five? So no, every one of those scenarios provides uh, and presents a new um, challenge or a new uh, thought process on, as to how you're going to swim it. All right, as we said, uh, what are the expected currents? At what time of the day will the race be done? Is If it's early morning and the area in which you're swimming um, is, is uh, accustomed to as soon as the sun comes up, it's going to get really, really hot. So the swimmers start off cool, but then they, right when they're really working, they're getting that, that sun put on them. And it, it kind of exacerbates, you know, twofold uh, dehydration. And, and so they need to be prepared for that. Same thing could be uh, if it's late evening uh, or early evening and the sun will start to be going down, but it gets cold really quick. Uh, you need to be prepared for that as well. Where are the emergency stations located? Now, we... If you can't already tell, we've talked about safety and emergency quite a bit already. But your athlete needs to know where it is they need to go if they get into trouble. What do they do if they need to get attention? Um, and then during the race, you need to keep your eye on your athlete as best as you can the entire time. This isn't one of those things where as a coach, um, hey, your athlete gets in and, and they're off and running. They aren't gonna be back for another 10 minutes. I'm gonna run over to the store. You need to be there on location. And if you can walk the course, walk the course. You don't have to walk the entire thing, but <clears throat> so you can keep an eye on them the entire time. There's nobody responsible for that athlete more than you are 
And, you know, so you are better prepared as a coach to prepare your athlete as well as being prepared. Do not rely on the host to keep your athletes safe. If it's not safe, don't swim. I wish for our athlete um, that we had been smart enough or uh, had had the ability to foreshadow to for you know foresee what was going to happen uh, to stop him. So um, if you have uh, an athlete uh, that's going to be getting in a swim and you know you have questions as to whether this is safe or not, don't let them swim. I would much rather spend the money and not get anything out of that money than to lose a life because I was afraid to say, oh, you know, we spent all this money and, and we needed to compete. If it's not safe, don't swim, period. And, and you know, I, I I would happily get fired, uh, get told to, to bounce, go kick stones, whatever. Um, if, if I felt strongly enough that uh, my athlete wasn't wasn't safe, wouldn't be safe, and I told them not to swim, I, I at least would be able to put my head on a pillow and and, and have a good night's sleep. Um, you know, knowing that I, I did what was best that I thought for our athletes. So keep that in mind, please. All right. So open water race strategy, know your competitors. Some will go out fast and fade. You know, we know our, our pool athletes. Many of you know the club next door or the club that, you know, you're in direct competition with, you know, their athletes. Hey, this swimmer is going to go out really, really slow, but look for them at the end because they'll be coming back guns blazing. Um, or they go out really, really fast, and but they can't hang on. So they'll die at the end. Let them go, and you just keep going. You know, So know your competitors. Same thing for open water. Uh, some will stay back and let everybody else do all the work and save up all their energy. And then at the very end, build into a fast pace for a finish. Uh, the one who goes fast consistently throughout the race has the best chance of doing very, very well. Over the duration of the race, the one who goes the fastest most consistently is typically the one that's gonna be on the podium. One, two, and three, right? So it's not the one that goes out the fastest. It's not the one that goes out the slowest. It's not the one that finishes the fastest. If they didn't go out fast enough at the beginning, coming back faster than everybody and still being 10th doesn't, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't get you on the podium. The one that's most consistent is uh, consistently fast is the one that has the best chance of doing well. All right. Um, Train your athletes to swim at their own pace, all right? Overextending their capabilities does not pay off any dividends, does not present any really good results uh, if they are out of their, their, not out of their comfort zone. They should be out of their comfort zone all the time. Uh, but if they are out of their physical capability, all right? So make sure that they understand you got to swim within your capability, uh, but and you've got to be comfortable doing it, and then continually try and push a little bit. All right. Um, if another athlete can help them, for example, if they if they can um, uh, draft off another athlete, and and I'll show you a video um, fairly soon uh, where uh, it kind of covers uh, drafting. All right. Um, by all means, let them, all right? This doesn't mean you have to be first all the time, the entire race. Many athletes um, will be in the back part of the, uh, the pack of say five or six swimmers and they'll be at the back and, and they're just getting pulled along by the other athletes. The ones that are working harder are the ones in front of them. 
the one that is working and saving some of that energy is the one that's behind them. So it's okay, all right? Let them know, just be comfortable back there. And if you wanna make a move, make sure that you are capable of making that move. You don't wanna get stuck in the middle. All right, let's go over feeding a little bit. All right, the feeding sticks and your, your strategy, all right? You must follow the guidelines for feeding stick length and what you are allowed to have hanging off of the stick. Now, what I am pertain, uh, what I'm referencing there is when we first started um, and, and the events started to get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, all of the coaches had their feeding sticks and they all wanted to feed at the same place. So at the, as the swimmers would, would come up to the feeding station, there were about 20 coaches all trying to be in the same spot. Well, we all looked alike. The sticks all looked alike. They were the same length. And so we wanted to uh, do something that was a little bit different. So we got this big old U.S. flag and hung it at the end of the end of the pole. And as our athletes got closer, it was clear where our flag was. And at the end of that flag was going to be the feed. So as they got closer, we would pull the flag in, dip the pole down. They got the drink. All right. So the next competition, everybody's got a flag. And now you've got a bunch of colors and they start to blend in and everything looked the same. <clears throat> so now they just allow uh, a small um, a small flag or identifier of the pole. Pole is all, you know, can't be any longer than, um, you know, what's allowed. Uh, so all we, uh, you know, what we would try and do is have something that would distinguish yourself from everybody else. All right. Take a look before the race. If people have like small flags, then you want to do some kind of a bright color. If everybody's got a bright color, then you want to do a flag that's going to have different colors and, and it'll draw the uh, attention of your swimmer. What about your your guard? What would you wear as a shirt? Uh, anything that's fluorescent that would make you stand out <clears throat> that that athlete would know. Now, the question would be, are you better off standing in front on the, on the um, pontoon or the feeding station, or are you better to be in the back? That is going to be something that you'll work out with your athlete. I had two communications with my athletes. If they were in a pack and they were towards the front, I would be at the latter part of the feeding pontoon. And that would be, as they came in, everybody else would be breaking off and they would be able to find me towards the end and be able to join the group without any problem. If they were in the back of the pack and the, there's another pack or, um, you know, they were slightly back, then I would probably find myself at the beginning of the pontoon because everybody would come in and move off. By that time, as they started to move off, it would clear out and allow me plenty of time to feed uh, my athlete uh, before they had to then take off. And actually, they would get it done quicker. So whatever strategy you choose, make sure that you communicate with your athlete long before the race ever, you know, takes place. You want that ingrained in their head. Hey, I'm in the pack. I'm in the lead group. I'm going to be looking to the end. Hey, I'm in the pack, but I'm at the back. Hey, I'm going to be at the beginning. That way you can uh, communicate that ahead of time, All right? Always know where your athlete is. Um, I am at the 2012 um, Olympic Games, 
my athlete is coming up and uh, I notice a coach next to me who is on his phone and, and he's, he's playing a video game. And I'm up, I, I've been up, I had my, my drink prepared for my athlete well in advance. Uh, I'm just waiting for him to come. And coaches are communicating, hey, you know, here comes so-and-so, here comes, because coaches actually can and should be working together with each other rather than fighting each other. Um, so I get my feet off um, to my swimmer. He takes off, swimmer directly behind him, comes up, stops, and his coach is on the phone. Hadn't prepared anything, and, and that swimmer did not get a feed and lost about 20 meters. 20 meters uh, is huge just because that swimmer was trying to get a feed and the coach was scrambling to try and get them some fluid, but it was too late, and he ended up taking off. Know where your athlete is, all right? You have to be every bit a part of that race and engaged in that race as your athlete is. You prepared them. Now, now you have to see it through, all right? So that was vital, and that, that swimmer ended up doing very poorly. Uh, because they they faded. Uh, understand that when it comes to hydration and when it comes to your energy system and your energy levels, once the activity starts, you are going to deplete that energy system. When you feed or when you hydrate, it does not replenish or give back what you lost it just slows the process down. Very, very important. You never get back what you what you use. You can slow it down, maybe a little bit. Uh, it, it'll make the body feel better. Um, but you're just slowing the process down. Eventually, over time and distance, that athlete will fade and they will fail sooner or later. We train them not to fail during the race because they've trained far enough but we also have to supply them with nutrition or hydration in order to slow that, that uh, depletion of the energy stores. So when that athlete didn't get a feed and they needed it, that was part of their calculation, he faded quicker and, and failed uh, miserably at the end. <clears throat> if there are multiple feeding sticks that are the same length, stick, uh, bring your stick, in closer so your athlete can see where um, where to go for the feed. So everybody's got their stick out there. Uh, if everybody is at the same link, just bring yours in just a little bit and then they'll be able to see, uh, you know, this is gonna be really confusing, but shorter, they're gonna be able to see their identifier and know where to go. Once your athlete has their drink, Remove your pole out of the way. Too many coaches leave that uh, leave it there and talk or watch uh, their athlete uh, as other athletes are starting to come in behind them. That means they're going to be running into your pole and you are now interfering and potentially putting your athlete at risk for being disqualified, right? So once you have your feed and your athlete gets their feed, bring that pole up. So it doesn't interfere with other athletes and you can give room to other coaches to get in there, all right? It does not make sense to me that a coach would get in there and because I'm here, nobody else gets anything and I'm gonna keep it from any other coach getting in there to feed their athlete. To me, that's unsportsmanlike. I don't like it. I don't think that should be part of our sport. Everybody should have a chance um, and let the athletes do what they do. Let's not coaches, you know, let's let us not be the reason why we didn't do anything. We didn't swim the race. So let's not interfere with that. Once you're done feeding, 
step back, bring your pole up and step back out of the way and let another coach do what they got to do. You'll appreciate it if another coach does that for you. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very big on that, um, and, and I hope you are uh, as well. All right, work together uh, with the coaches on the feeding, pond, uh, feeding boat. There have been times on a feeding station that I fed another athlete from another country because their coach was disabled, um, dropped their, their water bottles or their feeds, and it went all over uh, so they didn't have anything to give them. I'm, I fed them. I don't want the reason to be, um, you know, that that swimmer got uh, in, in danger because their coach, um, you know, dropped the, it, it was an accident, dropped the drinks. And I wouldn't give them a drink. That, again, that doesn't make any sense to me. The race should be in the water and, and let them do their thing. If my athlete is taken care of, uh, you know, then what do I got to worry about? There was uh, an athlete from the Middle East that uh, didn't have, at, at a world championship, it was a uh, uh, championship where we were selecting uh, for, I believe it was the 2008 Olympic Games. And um, uh, they didn't have a coach out there. And we didn't realize it until later um, that they're actually wanting to coach out there to feed them. And so there were about five, five countries that were all trying to feed the swimmer. First, we had to get them to understand that we were putting the sticks out for them. And then there were five countries all fighting, hey, take mine, take mine, you know, and, and trying to feed them. Now, that's the, that's the sportsmanship that uh, I, I, the mentality I think we ought to have on a feeding station, on a feeding pontoon. Not one that, uh, you know, they're shoving elbows, shoulders, uh, too many people trying to do too many things, right? Let's just see that our athletes have that, everything that they need, that they're safe, they're well-equipped, uh, and, you know, let the race happen in the water, not on a feeding pontoon. All right, let's talk about how to how to make a feeding pontoon or a <laughs> feeding stick. Um, use a collapsible stick, uh, for example, a painter a painter's stick. All right, uh, it's one that can go out. You can tighten it, and you can unscrew the uh, whatever would be at the end. All right, and you can see here, um, this would be one of those. All right. And then they unscrewed here, um, whatever was at the end, uh, and then duct tape around that end and made cup holders, you know, for the for the jug. Again, this would be the same thing in yellow. Now notice that this yellow with the blue um, is, is the same as the yellow and the blue here, right? So. These were the same country, two different athletes. And this one was feeding with the flag. This one was feeding with the, uh, the other flag, that's Japan, but the same colors. So the swimmers would be able to identify each other's uh, pole, but it was also very significant because it was the same. Swimmers can easily go to something that looks the same, right? Um, something that measures what you need and then um, can also easily be compacted and you can travel with it. Take the end off and affix uh, a cup holder by screwing it uh, on with screws or tape and make sure that there are no protruding sharp edges. That's, that's pretty important. Uh, swimmer comes up and accidentally hits your pole and it's got a sharp edge on it. Uh, now you've cut an athlete, All right? So take those down and avoid accidental cutting. There are specific guidelines on what it is allowed to hang on the feeding sticks. Make sure that uh, the flag you use is a bright version of your flag or 
a bright version of something else. But also know the rules. Go to FINA, look it up. You can do it online if you don't have a book uh, and, and go to the open water section. It'll have all the specifications. Escorting a swim during a race or a practice, right? Everybody can see this, uh, this red buoy here. Those are actually uh, affixed now to the swimmers. So if you are doing a practice, I highly recommend that you or your club uh, invest in safety buoys. When I go and swim open water, uh, my wife and I always have one of these. You can store your valuables, your car keys and everything inside of that buoy. You can blow it up and it floats. So whenever we stop, I can hang on to that buoy without any work. I can float on it. And uh, it, it's very, very good uh, safety measure uh, for open water. Whoever came up with that was brilliant. Um, during a race, make sure that uh, you can keep your swimmer at your side at about three meters away. Have the swimmers follow you. Do not make the mistake of following the swimmer. All right. You are the one that's on top of the, uh, the water. You're the one that doesn't have your head in the water. So if you are sighting from one point to the next, then your swimmers need to follow you. You're the one that knows the straight line. They don't, all right? Too often, and I've been, I've been guilty of it myself, um, if the swimmer starts to go to the right, we start to go to the right with them. Well, now we're, we're just accepting the mistake they made and, and we got to bring them back and they're going to think they're going back and forth and they are because we allowed it. So, Train your athletes to know if I, you know, if the boat is going one direction and they're getting further away, they need to come back to the boat, not the other way around, right? If they're getting too close to the boat, they're the ones that need to back away. If it's a motorized craft, you don't have a choice. Keep them safe. If you got to move away, uh, then do so, All right? Um, when feeding, Move ahead of the swimmer and have them uh, uh, have the drink ready and then have the swimmer swim up to you and feed and then move on, All right? You, you definitely don't want to be behind the swimmer and then have them have to come back. So you move up in front, on line, have the drink ready, have them swim up and give them the drink, All right? And then have them take off. If you got to pick up the bottle or the cup, uh, you do what you got to do and then regain your position uh, to continue to escort or provide safety. All right, finding good places to train. Um, I have been in open water um, now since, uh, oh, 1987. Uh, and, um, so it, it's, it's been a long time. I can't get in the car and go for a long drive and, and see a little pond and, and not, not look at that and say, oh, that would be a good open water training place. I'm constantly looking at things for, um, you know, the possibility of positive training venue. Um, you know, so this is something that you need to, to be aware of. Uh, do not swim in a body of water that you do not know the cleanliness. Um, believe it or not, uh, we had uh, a club who um, they went out and did an open water swim and they found out it was a cesspool. Um, yeah, that, that was bad. Um, but just because it looks like a great body of water uh, does not make it so. So let's make sure that you know what that body of water is, what it is used for, who is the uh, authority that oversees that body of water. Can they give you a report? If anything happens, they're gonna ask for it. And if you cannot provide that information, you're gonna be in trouble. 
all right? Why would you put your athletes in this dirty water? I don't know. I didn't check. So make sure that you check. Uh, make sure that you know the depth, right? Do not allow your athletes to dive into water where you cannot see completely uh, the bottom of the, uh, the water uh, or have knowledge about how deep it is. It's, it's the same as a pool. So if the depth is, you can see the bottom of the pool, the depth is too shallow, there's no diving here. Why in a world would we allow somebody to dive in and we can't even see the bottom, right? So don't, do not let them do that and know the depth. Know where it's gonna get deep and where it's gonna get shallow. Uh, do you have access to a support craft, right? Again, just because you have access to a support craft, if you got 20 athletes out there and only one person uh, that's gonna be in a boat, uh, it doesn't matter if you have 20 craft. If you only have one person out there, it's not safe, don't go. If you have 20 craft and you've got 20 people in there, great, go for a swim and have a great time. Is there easy access in the case of an emergency, right? Again, it's one thing to find a body of water, um, but do you have access with emergency vehicles to get there if anything happens? Plan for the worst that could possibly happen. Then you will be prepared. And even then, sometimes we're, we're challenged. All right, what does the bottom consist of? Um, I jumped into... I jumped because I couldn't see the bottom. Um, and I jumped into a very, very soft, muddy bottom. And um, uh, I realized that if I had been higher, I, I could have very well jumped in um, and gotten too deep um, in that mud where I would have been below the water line and trying to get out there would have been nothing to get me out of the water and the suction uh, in the mud would have kept me locked in there the harder I tried. So know the consistency of the bottom, all right? Accidents are going to happen. You want to minimize any possible thing that you can uh, in order to prevent that and not being prepared for it. Is the body of water uh, navigate? Naviga <laughs> can you get around the water? Um, yes. So you want to make sure, you know, we did a, a, a swim um, in a cooling pond for an elect, uh, electric company uh, that was providing power uh, to a community. And the water was very, very, very uh, warm uh, in the dead of winter. That meant that there was times when the water was coming in from the plant uh, very warm and it was going to create a fog uh, over the water. We were out in the middle of the lake. Um, and the swimmers were out swimming. We were escorting them. And all of a sudden, the flo a fog started to form. Now we can't see the swimmers and the swimmers can't see us. So we were doing a little bit of Marco Polo, uh, trying to get those athletes back uh, to the boat where we knew that they were safe. A lot of calling out. Um, so do you know the water? Can you get around? And is it safe? All right. Chris, um, have, have we got uh, some questions? We do. We have quite a few questions. Um, right, let's, we're definitely let's not going. To, we're not going to be able to get through all of them. Okay. Um, one kind of that uh, might along with some stuff align with some stuff you've been talking about. Uh, what are your thoughts on training with wetsuits when it gets cold or colder? Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, you know, obviously competition, there are rules and guidelines for uh, competition. Um, you know, so that aside, if a wetsuit will allow you to do open water in water that typically would be too cold, uh, but a wetsuit would allow you to do that and you're safe uh, and warm enough, by all means, I, I think that's, that's a great idea. That's a great thought. Um, anything that would get you some open water um, that you otherwise wouldn't have. So, for example, wetsuit or regular suit, 
um, and, and you'd be just as safe in a wetsuit, if not safer, by all means, use that wetsuit. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Great idea. Awesome. And another question that we got was around kind of an ideal age to start, like to introduce open water. Yeah, um, I think uh, as early as they are swimming. So the youngest swimmers that you have, they don't have to do a 5K or a 10K. Have them do a 300, 300 meter swim or a 100 meter swim. All right. And if you're smart, you'll have the biggest and best prizes for the swimmers that do that open water swim or that 100 meter, uh, you know, for uh, a six or a seven year old. And, and surround them with safety so everybody's protected, but, you know, have the coolest prizes for those little kids because that's going to keep them coming back. That's going to get them really excited. I, I've learned uh, as an athlete, as a coach, and now out in the, in, in the business world, um, if you want to change the, the culture, then you start with your kids. You start with your youth. And if you really want to implement um, easy change within your uh, your club or your federation, start with those young kids and, and get them excited about it. Because as they grow, then they won't have that perceived open water is bad. Open water is not fun. Open water is this or open water. They're going to think open water gets me stopped. Open water is not that bad. I did all my training in the pool. I did this open water. I got stuff. It was cool. It was fun. That is, so start with the, the younger ages, um, but make the distance appropriate so that they, they can do it, all right? Uh, but highlight them. And you ought to be highlighting your, your older athletes as well uh, because those young kids need to be looking up to a, a, a star uh, or to some, you know, um, a, a celebrity, somebody that's, uh, that's got a name or is very popular. So start highlighting those athletes who actually have put in a lot of hard work and have done a lot of hard things to accomplish what they've done equally, if not more than what somebody in the pool. That federation has to acknowledge that um, these are our pool swimmers as well. They all deserve equally the same attention and the same respect for what they do. And then those young kids start to look up to them. And that's, that's when you start presenting a, a great atmosphere for a lot of success. Awesome. Thank you. Um, also being cognizant of time yep um oh this question so this person's um federation is holding some high level races for example qualifying at a high altitude yep. um but they're finding it potentially or feel it might be unfair for some swimmers since it's tough to train at such a high altitude how would you approach um you know kind of raising this concern with the federation right right <clears throat> um as a coach, um, I, I train further. Um, I, I actually, um, as, as a coach, if I'm training for an altitude swim, um, you know, some of the things that you might want to do is put a little bit of drag on the, on the athlete. Um, so if they're down at sea level, uh, put a little bit of drag because it's going to feel like you're dragging when you're at altitude and train a little bit further. Um, so, um, you know, 10% farther. If I'm doing a 4,000 meter um, set, then I'm gonna wanna do 4,400. Um, if I'm doing a 400 meter swim, I'm gonna wanna do something close to, you know, 450, just to make it a little bit further and um, try and bring that, uh, um, that acclimation, yeah, physiologically, there's not a whole lot you can do. Um, 
you know, there's there's not a lot you can do. The the only option is to not have, um, you know, the competition at altitude. That might be the only thing that uh, is available. Uh, but the same would be true if you were to come down. Um, so if you've got athletes training at altitude, um, you know, many would uh, suggest and the science would show that they've got an advantage if they come down at a specific time uh, and they get that little kick, that a little extra kick uh, coming down from altitude at sea level uh, that others wouldn't have. So they've got an advantage. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure. not really sure that I, I would have a specific answer other than simulate, um, you know, when you go from sea level to altitude, you feel like you're dragging. So put a little bit of drag on, on the swimmers. Uh, so that when they get up there, they don't have that drag that they were training with. And, and maybe that can help offset, uh, you know, some of that, uh, that feel. Physiologically, I don't know that, uh, you know, there's an answer other than using tents, uh, you know, to create an atmospheric pressure. Thank you for that answer. I know it's going to kind of vary on a case-by-case -case basis Absol as well. Absolutely. Um, since we're coming to the end of it, do you have any kind of wrapping up thoughts? And I can send you kind of a word document of questions and see if there's anything to uh, answer. Because there's a couple that are kind of similar that might be able to. Let, let's fire. Specific. Let's fire away uh, with the questions okay. um, because we're at, we're at the end. This was a photo. Um, I did a, a, a World Aquatics, it used to be FINA, um, in Ghana, and uh, did, a, did a clinic for them. These were coaches uh, that were all trying to get uh, something started. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's, let's go with uh, some questions. And Bert, uh, please feel free if you want to add anything uh, to, to chime in. Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts on self-feeding? So think like uh, what you might see in a running foot race. Uh, absolutely. So, um, and, and I'll, I'll stand up um, and try and get the camera down here. But uh, for males, you know, the, the suit line is right here. And there's the small of uh, the abdomen. So you can put in uh, feed packets uh, into... Uh, the waistband and and be able to uh, you snip just a little bit of the um, of that feed so it doesn't bleed out but it's it's already got a a tear started and um, what you can do is uh, put that into your waistband um, and use that in the middle of your race um, so if you're you work it out with your coach uh, but that athlete, uh, it, what I tell the athletes is you work this out with your coach on a, on a time after loop one, after loop two, after a feed or in between, um, and then be able to tear that, squeeze it, drop it and go. Uh, typically that's, you know, obviously it's going to be kind of a gel. Um, I, I don't know of any liquids that, uh, that would be available. But gel packs, uh, you know, that are going to have phosphorus, uh, um, uh, calcium, uh, uh, carbohydrates, uh, protein, um, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know the science on it. I, I do know that it it, it does uh, um, physiologically it does help, um, you know, the athletes because it's already broken down a little bit. Um, but it'll make them mentally feel, hey, I've got something, especially when you've got an athlete whose stomach feels like their walls are already touching. I got to have something uh, and get rid of the flavor in their mouth. Uh, it, it just, it, it helps them mentally. Awesome. I think that uh, your answer there kind of addressed some other questions that had been asked. So that's great. Um, here's a good one. So this coach has access to a lake that has some colder water, um, but their competition is going to be in this ocean where it's not uh, 
not as cold with bigger waves. Do you have any kind of advice to kind of simulate these different conditions from training to racing? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's a great, uh, that's, that's a dilemma. Uh, typically, uh, in my experience, I've been involved in the other way around, where we've had warmer water. Uh, and we were going to be training in colder water or actually competing in colder water. Um, and, and, you know, the typically what we would do in warmer water um, is, uh, you know, we would have them get in a cold shower uh, and spend more and more time in temperature, you know, set the, the water colder um, and uh, at the same temperature that they would find themselves in the competition. So it's not such a shock. Uh, if there's anybody who is allergic to cold water, that is me. Uh, I don't like cold water. Um, so I, I best, you know, I try my best. I do an open water swim in Lake Michigan, uh, which might as well be iceberg, um, you know, temperatures. Um, you know, so anything that you can do mentally to, to prepare them. Um, it, uh, I, I guess what I would tell you, if you are in colder water going to warm, don't stop your training, you know, continue to your, your training and, and just have them go to a, um, you know, a warm shower afterwards, uh, but also be prepared to hydrate them during the swim. All right, because they're, they're probably going to feel excessively hot. And uh, if you can, you know, a lot of times mentally, our, our bodies will respond to what we think and mentally what we're, what we're thinking. Um, if you can throw that off just a little bit, uh, that'll help. Uh, I don't know if I, I addressed that question. Um, you know, it, that's a tough one. Uh, if you just simply don't have access to warmer water, um, then don't stop what you're doing in preparation for, you know, for the swim. Uh, just know that they're probably going to be excessively thirsty. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Um, I think uh, we're going to be out of time for today, but what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll download the questions that haven't been answered and we'll try to see if we can get a couple of them answered just via text and then uh, when we send out the link with the recording we'll see if we can include a couple more of them great uh thank you everybody for attending i hope this has been uh beneficial this is our first so we will get better from here uh and hopefully uh this won't be just a one a year uh we want to make this on, on on a regular basis um, so that we can have a learning session, uh, but we can also have a, a, a communication session where we can have some back and forth. Um, I, I learn through other people's experiences. Um, and, and what I would tell you is if you don't, if you think you aren't smart enough to do this, I'm, I'm, I, I am living proof that you don't have to be smart uh, and, and end up uh, doing quite well. Um, I have learned through my own mistakes, but I learn uh, a lot of value through listening to what others have done. Uh, and I learn continually today. So I would love to hear what you're doing, the thoughts and ideas that you have coming up with this. We are in a beautiful time where open water is new enough Throughout time, open water is new enough that um, we get to set the direction and we get to set the standard. And we'll be the ones that everybody else will be looking back on saying, this is where it started. So I look forward to working with you uh, and, and helping you and guiding you any way that I can, but I also look forward to you guiding me. Um, so hope everybody has a great rest of the weekend. And uh, until next time. Thank, thank you, Rick. Uh, Bert Schroeder is here. I wanted to add that the next session is June 17. And the topic will be uh, athletes and August 26, an official session.
Thank you, Bert. Um, thank, thank you. Bert. you uh, on behalf of Pan Am Aquatics, thanks to Rick and Bert for helping make this session possible and enjoy the rest of your weekend.